This is an entire page in your first aid book. So take a sip of that coffee and focus back in as we beast mode this content. We are perfectly aware that myocardial infarctions occur when there is a decrease in blood flow so severe that we quickly progress from myocyte swelling to necrosis. We are particularly concerned about the left anterior descending coronary artery. It has to cover the most territory, followed by the right coronary artery, and the right coronary artery is very important in supplying the SA and AV nodes. Now the third most common artery to be concerned about is the left circumflex. This comes off the left main coronary. Now expect to see signs of excessive sympathetic nervous system activity, such as sweating, nausea, and vomiting. These people are in pain. They're afraid. They're going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. Now the pain is going to be described as retrosternal behind the sternal wall. Why is it going to be retrosternal? Because that is where the ischemic myocardium is located. The referred pain classically describes pain radiating into the arm. Why does this occur? This occurs because the afferent sensory fibers from the heart and from the skin of the arm both use the same dorsal root ganglion in the C7 to T5 distribution. The brain can misinterpret the afferent pain signals from the heart as also coming from the arm. So let's examine what is going on at a histopathologic level. In the first zero to four hours, we see nothing. We see no gross or microscopic changes, but there is still a risk of arrhythmia, heart failure, and cardiogenic shock. Why? Why do we see nothing but then still have all these risks? It takes a while for there to be sufficient leak of intracellular enzymes and activation of other enzymes within the cells to occur before we can actually see the cellular damage. But the hypoxic environment still puts us at risk for a hypocontractile heart in the case of heart failure or cardiogenic shock. Remember, without adequate oxygenation, the heart is going to flip over to anaerobic metabolism. This leads to a dramatic reduction in the production of ATP. What else are we going to get? We're also going to get an increase in lactic acid. The decrease in ATP disrupts the function of the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. Now what happens to this pump when there is much less available ATP? It does not work very well. So then we accumulate sodium intracellularly. This is very important because it pulls in water and this causes cellular edema. And we accumulate potassium extracellularly. And this can we accumulate potassium extracellularly. This can increase our risk for arrhythmia, secondary to hyperkalemia. So let's look at the features of an MI visible in the first 4 to 24 hours. Your step 1 exam will describe the histopathologic changes or provide you an image of the microscopy slide. Then you have to identify the time frame or the greatest risk for the time frame that you're in. Now the gross features are not the highest yield info. You can derive them if you know what is going on at the extremely high yield microscopic level. So we had some cellular swelling and now we have completely progressed to necrosis, which means that the contents have coagulated within the unstable plasma membrane of our cardiomyocytes. So here's our plasma membrane and it's starting to get very unstable. This does not happen immediately, which explains why you don't see any changes until the 4 to 24 hour window. Now what are some things that are particularly high yield for your step 1 exam that are going to spill out from these dying myocytes because their membranes are very unstable? Intracellular enzymes such as lactate dehydrogenase, creatine kinase MB, and troponins. These markers don't just hang out in the extracellular environment. They get whisked away into the lymphatics then they go into the venous system, and this is why we stick a needle in the patient's veins and examine the blood looking for these markers. These markers are supposed to stay inside cardiac myocytes, but when they're damaged, they're liberated in the blood, and we can detect them. This is also the principle behind the tetrazoleum stain. So tetrazoleum binds 
lactate dehydrogenase very strongly. So if an area infarcted and the cell spilled out all of these enzymes, the area that infarcted no longer has any LDH because the cells died and leaked all of their LDH out. If there is no LDH, the area does not pick up the tetrazoleum stain, and it is going to be pale. Now, when we damaged those cells, we not only liberated the cardiac markers we looked for, but we also spilled out a bunch of DNA breakdown products. These are potent stimulators of the inflammatory response. In addition to that, these cells are exposed to a very hypoxic environment. Remember, hypoxia is going to induce the release of a transcription factor, hypoxia-inducible factor. This turns on a bunch of inflammatory genes, including the production of vascular endothelial growth factor. Now, which cells are going to be the first to respond to this inflammatory trigger? How about neutrophils, or polymorphonucleosides? So these neutrophils are going to show up at around 12 to 24 hours. Very important is reperfusion injury. What is reperfusion injury? Well, let's say our patient was sent to the catheterization lab to restore blood flow to the myocardium by putting in a stent. So now, all of a sudden, a ton of oxygen and blood is going to come into the recently infarcted area. The only problem is that we have all of these neutrophils in this infarcted zone. The neutrophils are trying to help break down some of the necrotic myocytes. So these neutrophils use oxygen to make reactive oxygen species. This actually leads to more damage. Now what else is delivered to this infarcted area during reperfusion? How about calcium? Calcium's in the blood, right? So we introduce a bunch of calcium to recently damaged myocytes. The sarcomeres within the myocytes are exposed to the calcium, and this leads to contraction. But since there is no ATP, we cannot uncock the myosin head. The sarcomeres remain contracted. This is the whole principle behind contraction band necrosis. So the complications are still the same for the first 24 hour period. Now, what about one to three days post MI? At this point, we really start to see tons of neutrophils and necrotic debris. So here's an image showing us the acute inflammation with neutrophils and then the nuclear debris because the cells have died and spilled all their contents. The nuclear debris is from the dead myocytes basically. So at this phase, we also begin to see coagulation necrosis. So coagulation necrosis is when there is denaturing of the intracellular contents. So what happens is that the cytoplasm and the nucleus blur together, but the membrane can still be semi-intact, which means that everything inside of the membrane is going to be coagulated and denatured. So during this time period, we also have a new risk we have a new potential complication of fibrinous pericarditis. So why are we at risk for fibrinous pericarditis? There's tons of inflammation mediated by these neutrophils. This inflammation can extend into the pericardium. This is the risk for fibrinous pericarditis. What happens next in the evolution of NMI? Well, the neutrophils are always the first guys on the scene. They call for backup. Who are the neutrophils going to call? So around 3 to 14 days, the neutrophils call in the backup squad. So in any situation of inflammation, after neutrophils are done performing their job, they call in monocytes, and we know that monocytes are converted to macrophages when they hit extracellular matrix tissue outside of vessel wall. And how are the monocytes going to access the area of inflammation in the heart? Remember, we said vascular endothelial growth factor was released due to the hypoxia. So this is what happens. After a couple of days of stimulation by vascular endothelial growth factor floating around, vessels start growing around the edges of the infarct. Vessels finally start to grow into this granulation tissue, and they always start at the borders. This is why we have a very nice hyperemic or very red border surrounding the pale infarct. 
The monocytes use these very weak vessels to transmigrate into the necrotic tissue. So the macrophages now have a humongous buffet and just start munching up all of that dead tissue. So when this whole process of inflammation is complete, this area, despite infarcting, is still going to need blood supply because scar tissue still needs a blood supply. So here, notice how the area is very yellow looking. That's because neutrophils and dead myocytes look yellow. So what about this word softening in your book? The macrophages that come in here are going to be like Pac-Man. They're just going to be gobbling up all this necrotic debris and the dead neutrophils. This is all happening in an already very weak myocardial infarcted tissue wall. Do you think this area is going to be as strong as normal tissue? No. So the combination of all of this phagocytosis plus the necrotic wall sets us up perfectly in this 3 to 14 day window for very, very bad complications. So if the entire wall is affected from the infarct, we need to worry about free wall rupture. So here is an image of what can happen when this very, very infarcted area is consumed by macrophages. You can weaken the wall to the point where you can get a free wall rupture. So this black arrow here shows us the communication between the left ventricular chamber all the way through into the pericardial space. This can lead to tamponade because blood is going to flow straight through this gap and accumulate around the heart, causing tamponade. Now what happened in the situation of NMI if we now have a new murmur? There are several options. We could have infarcted our interventricular septum. We could have infarcted a papillary muscle, leading to a new onset mitral regurgitation, specifically an occlusion of the septal branches of the left anterior descending can kill our septum and we can rupture leading to a new perforation that's a VSD, allowing a communication between the left and the right ventricles. Specifically, when we talk about papillary muscle infarction, we think about the posterior descending artery being affected. This can kill the posteromedial papillary muscle. We can see that here. The papillary muscle we are interested in is one of the three in this image. It is postero or posterior and medial. It attaches to the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. It prevents the mitral valve leaflet from ballooning up into the left atrium whenever we contract our left ventricle during systole. But guess what happens when we infarct it? The mitral valve leaflet will have nothing holding it back from flailing up into the ventricle during systole. We now have an acute onset of mitral valve regurgitation. One last thing we need to be worried about is the formation of a pseudoaneurysm. So pseudo means false and aneurysm is Greek for dilation. So what about this is false? The layers of the heart involved and the time. So false aneurysms occur in the three to 14 day window. And as you can see, there's only one layer within the wall of this aneurysm. We infarcted the endocardium, we infarcted the subendocardium and the myocardial tissue. All of these are gone. This makes this aneurysm false because we need not one, but three for a true aneurysm to be surrounding this dilatation. The only thing holding this aneurysm from exploding is one layer. So these fibrous adhesions within the epicardium are very important. This is high risk for rupture. Again, the main thing you need to know about a pseudoaneurysm is that it is an incredibly high risk for rupture because there is only one very weak layer left holding on. So let's step forward in time and examine things occurring after we hit the two week mark. So after our macrophages went into the infarct and cleared out all the debris, they started releasing tons of cytokines. So they start releasing transcription growth factor beta and platelet derived growth factor. These tell fibroblasts to start making tons of collagen to replace the area previously occupied by healthy myocytes. This gives us scar tissue. It appears grayish white on gross examination. And in the right image under the microscope, we can see there's just a ton of collagen. There are not very many cells anywhere. Collagen stains pink. Again, notice how there are no myocytes. K 
can an area without myocytes contract? No. So this area of the ventricle is going to be very hypocontractile or hypokinetic. It is just going to be like a bed sheet flapping in the wind when the rest of the heart contracts. This means that this area is particularly weak and can bulge out when there's sufficiently high enough systolic pressure. Now this is how we develop a true aneurysm. So notice how there is a ballooning out of all three layers. Do we need to worry about rupture with a ventricular true aneurysm? No, we do not. Rupture is only a concern with a pseudo or false aneurysm. True aneurysms, like this one, rarely ever rupture because they are composed of tough scar tissue that has replaced all three layers of the cardiac wall. The main concern with a true aneurysm is what? This area is hypocontractile because it's all scar tissue. No myocytes that could contract. We are worried about stasis that can occur in this very hypocontractile area. So blood can actually pool and form a clot in this very hypokinetic segment of the myocardial wall. We call this a mural thrombus because it literally forms on the wall. So mural means wall. Forming a huge clot in the left ventricular chamber that is responsible for pumping blood to the rest of your body is a problem. All that has to happen is for a couple pieces of this stuff to break off and then get sent into the aorta and now you're throwing around blood clots everywhere. We've broken off pieces of the thrombus and now we're starting to embolize. You'll be asked about some key complications in this time period. Very high yield is Dressler syndrome. Think back to when we were talking about how the macrophages were phagocytosing all of the cardiac tissue. What do you think might happen if your immune cells are consuming your own necrotic cardiac tissue? Well, a macrophage is an antigen-presenting cell. All that has to happen is for a macrophage to take a cardiac antigen and slap it onto a major histocompatibility complex number two, and guess what happens when it communicates with a helper T cell? Now we've, boom, activated our immune system against our own heart. And this is the whole concept behind Dressler syndrome. All right, so we spent an appreciable amount of time discussing the pathology behind an MI, but we did it for a reason. Extremely high yield, you must know it. Now let's move on and keep talking about myocardial infarctions.